Okay. Uh, hello, welcome everyone to the uh, seventh webinar in the new barn raising webinar series. Uh, the topic today, as you can see, is traditional and modern assets. Uh, my name is uh, Gareth Potts. I'm uh, the guy who's been sending you all these emails, uh, and I sort of set up uh, this this webinar series to be a, a common free point where people across uh, different types of assets in different countries can uh, share information about raising awareness, raising money and resources, and raising raising volunteer support for their community and civic assets. Uh, there is a website, uh, the new barn raising dot com. Uh, please. Uh, check that out if you have some time. There's a free toolkit that outlines tips from across the U.S. on on the sort of things I was just outlining. Uh, there's links to the the webinars, the, the webinar sign up page, and a YouTube channel that has recordings of all the past webinars. Uh, there's also a series of of uh, articles on there uh, that that kind of summarise the the things that are in the toolkit. In terms of today's focus. Um, really, really quite contrasting approaches, looking at, on the one hand, some very old uh, technology uh, and, and sort of approaches in terms of the terms of assets, uh, in terms of community ovens and communal eating, uh, but also uh, the very, very sort of leading edge technology and its use in terms of, uh, you know, community, uh, being a community and civic resource. So dig digital assets, um, locally generated knowledge in libraries and local control of information and networks. Uh, in terms of the, the, the two speakers we've got from, from um, Park Avenue Community Oven, we have uh, two speakers. Uh, the first is uh, Ali Shaver. So uh, in addition to being a volunteer with the oven, uh, Ali is also an urban planner with the public health, her local public health service. So a very strong uh, focus in her work on, on making sure health is built into the sort of local plans. Uh, she's also a member of the Halifax Food Policy Alliance, so dealing with food security. Um, she's been in the area almost 10 years now uh, and lives with her family in Dartmouth, um, which is just over the river uh, from, 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 from Halifax in Nova Scotia. Uh, Jeff uh, has also been volunteering with, with the oven. He was part of the group that planned and established it in 2012. Uh, and by, by day, he's also a, a comms and policy officer for Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. Uh, he too lives in, in the town uh, with his wife and two children. The uh, second speaker is from the UK, Anne-Marie Naylor. Uh, she's the director of Common Futures, so a company uh, for, the, for the last couple of years she's been director of that. That deals with uh, the sorts of issues she's uh, going to be talking about today. Um, she's also been at the forefront of community assets policy and practice in the UK for the last seven years or so um, with the Development Trust Association and its uh, modern day organization in, in uh, England and Wales locality. She helped establish the asset transfer unit uh, for, for the government, uh, overseeing the community rights service, uh, a national community libraries network. She's worked with the Arts Council for England on, uh, on re reports and research around income generation in public libraries. I'd urge you to check that out if, uh, if you're looking to raise money for your library. Um, she's also a, a member of the government's local public data panel. Uh, and then late last year, she was awarded uh, an MBE for her work on uh, community asset ownership. And for anyone outside uh, uh, the UK or the Commonwealth, uh, it's, a, it's a very prestigious award. And she was also awarded a We Share Award last year for her work around common libraries. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to the folks in uh, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, there, there it is, just in case uh, any of you weren't, weren't too sure where it, where it was. Um, so, I'm not sure actually who's going to speak right first, but uh, Jeff and Ali, uh, over to you, please. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, it's Jeff here, and I will speak first. Um, let me give Ali an opportunity to say hello, so you'll recognize her voice. Hi, everyone. Um, so basically, I'd like to start with a, a brief uh, outline of the presentation so that you get a sense of where we're going this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to start with an introduction to the oven itself. I'll talk a little bit about how we made it happen. Um, Ali will talk then about why we love it. Um, and now we will also talk about uh, our experience in working with the, the Halifax Regional Municipality, which is the municipality that the community of Dartmouth belongs to. And we'll wrap things up with what we've cooked, what we've baked, and what others have baked um, in the oven. Just briefly, um, the Park Avenue Community Oven 
is a volunteer community run oven in the Leighton Dillman Park. And uh, this is a special park in Dartmouth. It's the lower part of the Dartmouth Common. And um, the common is a common concept to many people, particularly those in, in the UK and others that live in, in larger cities where there's an area of, of green space basically committed and, and left for the use of the, the common people. So in this particular section of uh, the oven, there were some community gardens. There's some beautiful rock walls that were built and, and maintained um, by a volunteer named Leighton Dillman. So the, the name of the park that we're actually located in is the Leighton Dillman Park. And we're just adjacent to um, some community garden beds. Uh, those community garden beds um, were around for two decades or so. And it was only within the last 10 years that, that I discovered them and began working and gardening in that area. Um, the project was conceived um, by working with the overseer of the gardens, uh, Billy Lewis. He's a First Nations. Aboriginal elder. Um, he's worked all over Canada in, in food security and food education. Um, one day we were gardening there and we were talking about our children and he was, began talking about children that he had worked with in, in the west coast in Vancouver in a, in a city in an urban garden. And the use um, of pizza gardens within his education work that he did there um, to help kind of educate children and interest them in gardening, so he would he would plant and create these circular gardens um, that would have pieces within it, and each little piece of the pizza would be a um, would be like a, an ingredient for the pizza, and so the children were then able to harvest the, that food and and, um, and and you know cook their own pizzas basically with the food that they've grown. You're looking right now at a picture of the oven uh, shed, and you can't really tell that what's inside of it. And it was built this way kind of purposefully because the park historically had been one where um, there would be vandalism, there would be uh, people kind of hanging out, perhaps with too little to do. And, and by having such a sturdy structure to contain the oven, we were um, confident uh, that it would not be the, the victim of some vandalism. And so far, that holds true. <laughs> Um, I think the next slide, if we click to it, may show just how we would open up this oven. And you'll see in the, the next slide as well that the sides really fold out, creating a, a bit of an awning and also creating a, uh, some stainless steel countertops. So three of the four sides open up in this fashion, um, while the frontmost uh, portion, the front of the oven structure, opens up barn door style and, and allows people to access the oven. Um, this project began uh, in 2011, uh, kind of it, it with the impetus of, of Billy Lewis's work that he'd done. The thought that, well, how nice would it be if we could create a public oven adjacent to these gardens that people could do uh, their gardening, grow their food, prepare their food, and then cook it together with members of the community that might not otherwise be spending time together. We uh, pulled a small group of people together, um, people that I knew personally at the time, and, and kind of sent out some notes via social media, eventually gathering a group of about six or so. Um, discussions were, were kind of um, high in the sky, kind of dreamy at the first. And then we started to make up some posters and, and get other people to come to the meetings as well in the community. Um, we talked about different styles of oven, ovens that people have seen and worked with. Um, I, I had spent time in Toronto and Ali had as well where the uh, ovens at a, in a city park there on Dufferin Grove were a particular style and very similar concept in terms of a public oven. But we wanted to find something that would be designed to reflect some of the traditions in, in Nova Scotia. So uh, a traditional Acadian style oven is what we ended up with. Um, we, we, we sourced some quotes from professional builders and we went to our community counselor uh, for the district that the, the park and, and the rest of us live in and basically pitched uh, the idea. And so she, without much question, accepted the, the idea, thought it was a wonderful one, and uh, the rest is history. In about July or August of 2012, the oven was built uh, by a local builder. And she hired a, a crew to come and create this uh, post and beam kind of transformer building that, that, that houses the oven. Um, in the time since uh, building the oven, we've learned a lot, I think, about just the, um, the public engagement piece and certainly the response from community. 
uh, a project like this, um, when, from our perspective, when we entered into the, the planning phase, we were all quite excited about the prospect. And, and we had done our part in terms of postering and inviting people to attend the meeting. <clears throat> and we were also kind of um, confident because there had been a larger public common master plan done in just a, a year or so prior to the, the project um, that we undertook. And within that project, there was um, there was acceptance and there was consultation done on, on these sorts of projects. So the fact that we didn't go do a full public consultation on it, uh, we didn't feel it was necessary. However, we were very heavily criticized when the ground broke on this project. And there was a bit of press and there was a bit of upset from neighbors and people that were living close to the park, concerned about the, the loss of what they considered to be some valuable square footage of, of what they called, in quotes, their backyard. Um, so we had to deal and, and really kind of accept uh, people's dissatisfaction and, uh, and move on from there. It was for us a, a part of a part of doing something in a community. So it was interesting. Those that were the most vocal um, had not been to the oven. And then once they started coming to the oven, they became very supportive. So it was a matter of experiencing firsthand, I think, um, being at the oven that really turned people around. And I think I've kind of covered um, how we made it happen. You know, we've gotten a lot of support from uh, Gloria, the, the counselor that I mentioned, and also from other community businesses um, but maybe I'll let Ali talk a little bit about why we love it. Okay. Unless there's anything you wanted to add. Well, maybe I'll just add the, the next couple of slides you'll see are um, just how we build a fire. And so like Jeff was saying that we, we built a, a traditional Acadian oven. It's a cob oven. And so it's made from straw, sand, and clay. clay. <laughs> and, and some water. And some water. And so the, the dome is, is uh, around you know, eight, 8 to 12 inches in diameter. And it, it really, when you light a fire on the inside, it, the, the clay, the, the cob around the oven warms up and keeps the oven hot for, for a number of hours. And so the way that you get the, go, the fire going is you light a little fire at the very uh, sort of front entrance to the oven. And then you slowly make that a stronger and fuller fire. And then you somehow push it back to the sweet spot in, in the middle of the oven and let it burn for two to three hours. And then eventually the oven gets to be around 1,000 degrees. And so that means you can cook a pizza in around 90 seconds. So it's a, it's a cob, cob oven, a fire um, burning cob oven. And there it goes, a stronger fire. And I think Jeff touched on this, but there are sort of two basic principles that we use to operate the oven. The first one is that it's 100% operated by um, volunteers, and so that means we do all the social media, we, pr we host all the events, we do all the partnership developments, we maintain the door. When the, when the lock breaks, we fix it. Um, and so we, we, there's our small group, which is of volunteers, is slowly growing. <laughs> we started with six, and I think we're probably around 15 on a good day. Um, we, we, are, we operate the oven. Um, and then secondly, it's a completely community public oven, and so it can be used and, and booked um, by, by anyone. Um, if you're not trained in how to light the fire or how to cook in the oven, then we come, a volunteer comes and, and hosts you at the oven and helps your, your group cook. So here are some slides that Jeff spoke to earlier. This is the, these are the, the community gardens, and Billy Lewis is the fellow in the brown there standing up with the shovel. He's, he was pretty integral at the um, and getting this off the ground. There the ovens. Um, oops, and now it's good. Um, here, here's um, the, a picture of the oven uh, under construction on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, again, is Billy Lewis um, shaking hands with our local councillor, McCluskey, um, who, who provided the funds to get the oven um, the built. So we were able to um, secure $20,000 in funding, and so five of it went to the oven, 13 approximately went to the structure, and then that left us with a, um, some money left over to buy, buy the wood and buy the pizza peels and some cleaning um, materials, and so it sort of got us off the ground. And here is our oven. This is probably one of our first burns in the fall of 2012. Um, the woman on the left is Gina Arthur. She um, built the oven and the structure. And then there's Councilor McCluskey again in the middle. And then one of our, our main volunteers from the very beginning, uh, uh, Lori Rand. And we opened with a smudge ceremony um, by, uh, by Billy Lewis. Oops. Okay. 
Um, so some of the reasons why we love it, I know Jeff sort of mentioned mentioned a number of these, but we really see it as a way of extending the use of, of the common. And like Jeff had mentioned, uh, a year or two prior, the Dartmouth Common had, had just approved, or Halifax had just approved a new master plan for the Dartmouth Common. And in it, it called for diversifying um, the activities and the way that the, the park are pro is programmed. And so um, we worked closely with um, Brian Phelan, the, the park superintendent with the city at the time. And he loved the idea because he saw it as a way to implement the, the master plan and really bring new people to the park to do new things. Our tagline is, um, our, our name is Park Avenue Community Oven, but our tagline is, it's a place for people to grow, cook, and eat together. And, um, and that, that's really the, what, what, we are, what we achieve and have achieved as a group and as a community is, is this sort of vibrant, welcoming community space where you can do just that. And it, it attracts um, a number of different groups and individuals. Some of the groups that come to the oven, I never would have imagined during our sort of pre-build, pre-oven days when we, were, when we were daydreaming about what this oven might do in Dartmouth. I, some of the groups I, that come to the oven now, I never would have imagined. And so it's used by recreation therapists, occupational therapists from the hospital. Um, it's used by addiction and mental health uh, groups. In the, in the neighborhood. It's used by theater groups. The Magnetic North Theater Festival is a large theater festival in Canada, and they've come and hosted a, a, a dinner. Um, it, it was an event uh, space for the Pride Parade here. Um, and so large groups and community-based groups are using it in, in new and different ways that we never would have imagined. Um, and so it really is a place for people to connect, to meet their neighbor. I've met um, so many people, so many people in my community through my involvement in, in, in the oven, um, and it brings together a, such a diverse group of people. So the next, next couple of slides are just some of the events that I spoke about, and so you can see there's, you know, you don't, people don't just grow, cook, and eat together. They also do yoga at the, at the oven, and, and uh, the Halifax Library brought a volunteer, and they also do some book, outdoor book readings in the summer by the library. Um, and then we have uh, just, you know, our open oven Saturdays, the top right, that's just a normal Saturday. Every Saturday we're open um, to anybody who wants to come for and cook around lunchtime. And then the top left is a, is a harvest festival. We um, got a little bit of funding to host a, a sort of a, a fun, family-friendly afternoon with magicians and music and, and, and food to celebrate the, the fall harvest. So here's a picture. Um, another reason why I particularly love it is that I think that um, that the oven really brings a lot of joy and happiness. Um, here's a fellow who's just putting his pizza in. He's concentrating really um, closely. At, you know, that putting your pizza in for the first time is, is can be a little bit tricky and stressful. And then he looks back and he's accomplished it. And he's very excited and thrilled at uh, at being able to do it on his own. And there, he, or I guess it's not a pizza. It's a it's a loaf of uh, loaf of bread. And there he is, very proud of, of the bread that he's, he's baked. Um, this is a group from, from Halifax. They, they're uh, a group, uh, Hope Blooms in Halifax. They're a, a community garden group. Um, and they, they've done really well in making their salad dressings and, um, and into, a, into a business. Um, and now they, they have greenhouses. And um, their, salad, their small community salad dressing business has, has sort of blossomed. And they came over to check out the oven. It's, because this, this, this youth group is really interested, obviously, in, in food, and they were excited to see um, the oven over in Dartmouth. Here's a group of uh, beavers or cubs. I don't know. I think they're beavers. Came, and they made pizzas together. Um, and then here's a, there's a group of teenagers that also came in, in, uh, and used the oven. So just some of our staff. Uh, like Jeff said, we, 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 got, we got going in, in 2012. Um, and we had a sort of a half season then, and then 2013 was really our first full season. Um, community groups or individuals um, can book the oven. So we've had wedding rehearsals there. We've had book launches there. Like I said, the Magnetic North, the, the Pride Parade, Slow Food, Nova Scotia has been there. Um, a sausage festival has been there. Um, local employers come, and they have sort of staff lunches there as well. And so. 2013, we had 27 extra events, and we grew a little bit in 2014 with 33 extra events beyond our open oven Saturdays. And all, all things considered, 
um, at the end of the day, we've um, we have more than a thousand visits per season, and uh, and we have we've contributed more than fifteen hundred volunteer hours per season, which I think is pretty substantial. Maybe before you move from that slide, I think I kind of glossed over a little bit of how the volunteerism works, and I think it's something that continues to evolve um, since I've begun and since we, since the album was first created. We do most of our communication via the internet and, and email is kind of how we communicate with our volunteer base and, and typically we'll have a schedule for a couple of months at a time during the season so that people are committed to either lighting the oven or hosting uh, a group and usually those are about three hour shifts each for the open ovens on Saturday. So someone will come in at about nine o'clock and, and light the oven so that it's at its peak temperature for noon. And thereafter, somebody will come in and, and host the group sticking around in, until about 3 o'clock or so. And so these numbers are the sum total of the hours spent by those, pe those persons volunteering on those days and then in addition for the, the weekday and evening bookings. Um, and the numbers vary greatly on the open oven days. It depends if the weather's spectacular. It, it may be a huge crowd of 100 people or it may be a small crowd of a dozen because everybody's gone to the beach. Um, so when we have booking requests come in, we basically send an email out to a list serve of volunteers and, and people uh, fill out a, a brief form of yes, no to their availability and then we assign the volunteer from there and, and they basically look after um, the opening up of the oven, the lighting of the oven, uh, the hosting of and then, and then cleaning up and, and shutting down. But we do rely upon those, those people that have booked the oven to do all, a lot of the cleaning themselves and ensure that they leave this, this public community space in as good a, as good a shape as they found it. So we, we've included a, uh, this slide on how we work with the municipality. We, we've received a lot of emails um, and a lot of questions from other cities and other towns wondering um, what this relationship looked like and were there any public health concerns or um, city concerns and how did we navigate it. So, so I'll just speak briefly. Um, so pre-build, yes, there, there was, we had some people within the city on site. We had the park superintendent that loved the idea and we had a very supportive counselor who, who, um, who helped us navigate. Both of those, Brian and Councillor McCluskey, both helped us navigate the, the municipal system and, um, to make sure that the project was a success. That said, that we also had some other concerns, mostly from the risk department, the insurance department, um, wondering, you know, this is on public land and this is a community group um, organizing, you know, events with fire on public land and do we have insurance? And so we were able to, through our relationship with Brian Phelan, the park superintendent, um, sort of calm, calm um, the, uh, the insurance department down and say, like, yes, we do. This this is on public land. It is it's covered under HRN's general liability insurance. Um, people wonder about, you know, you're cooking food for the public. Um, you know, are, are do you have places to wash their hands? How do you keep them the food at a safe temperature? And so we've had we've had a number of conversations with our public health um, food inspector colleagues. Who are are were great. Um, they just said what we care about is if, if we want people to wash their hands. Is there a spigot and water um, on site? And I said yes. They said that's fine. And um, we also care about keeping food at safe temperatures. Can you keep it, you know, in coolers, or can you tell people to like bring it just before they cook it and make sure that you know they cook it in a timely way? And and we just did we did just that. And so. We were able to sort of issues were raised, and we were able to work through them and find find very simple um, and easy solutions to address some some concerns. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it's a wood fired oven, and so we 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 met with the um, the chief, the fire Depar chief of the fire department, mm -hmm. and he had no concerns whatsoever with with the oven or the structure um, and the fire in the park. Um, there have been the odd occasion where um, an, an open oven or a booking has happened. There may be some coal smoldering within the oven, the oven shut up, and then all of a sudden we get a, an, an email or a phone call saying that the um, fire department has shown up and busted the lock because they were unaware. So in this case, it, it was miscommunication between uh, members of the fire department locally and the most nearest one. And mm -hmm. uh, so we, we continually have to, to kind of repeat those messages and ensure that the, the new staff that may come on are also aware of the, the work that we're doing and, and that's part of ongoing community relationship building. Yes. 
Um, and and post build, we've had really great relationships uh, with Halifax. They they uh, funded the the design and the manufacturing of, of our sign. Um, they're looking into and have sort of uh, earmarked some funding in the in the ne next fiscal year budget to provide on-site washrooms. Um, and we've also had great relationship, developed a great relationship with Halifax Water. They provide hand washing stations for free um, at our at our bigger public events. Okay, so now on our last few slides, we'll just um, zip through them. They're just some images of uh, some of the delicious things that we've uh, we've cooked. So the vast majority of of things cooked at the oven are are pizzas. Um, we, we call it a community oven. Lots of people call it the pizza oven. Um, but, so yes, so pizza is cooked all the time. But there are other things that you can cook, like this jambalaya with some mussels, some local mussels and shrimp and some rice and peas. Um, people have cooked bagels and pretzels. There's lots of bread cooked. Um, that's just another fancier version of a pizza. Um, this is, again, I don't know what this is. Maybe like a movie? There was a baked Alaska done at one oh. time as well. Um, we've also had uh, the benefit of a, a local chef who's worked quite extensively with wood-fired ovens who um, has put on some cooking classes and really taught people a variety of different foods. One in particular was a filet mignon that was cooked in, cooked in the oven with a, a brick over top of it to kind of help um, the cooking process and the brick on top of it would heat up to the temperature of the oven and it would help to cook it in an even, quick way. Um, so there's her, her message to people is that there's really nothing that you can cook in your home oven that you can't cook in this oven. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, that, I think that's it. So we just have our, our website here, our Facebook, our email, our, our Twitter. Um, if you want to get in, in touch with us, we're happy to answer any other questions. Um, that we don't get to today's webinar on, on uh, Facebook or, or email. Um, and then just here, we'll just end on some of our, our supporters. And so it's really brought out all, all different kinds of people. The Downtown Business Association has, has provided funds. The hospital, uh, IWK is a women and children's hospital in Halifax. The Community Health Board has provided funds. Good, Goodwood is a, is a, um, a local wood supplier. Um, and they, they've donated cords and cords of wood to our oven. Um, and uh, a local designer designed our logo for a magazine ad and then provided it to, to us uh, uh, gratis. So that's, it. Uh, that's about it. Thanks very that's much. It okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks both very much. Uh, that's that's just um, amazing. I, I think it's become uh, my favorite asset. I have to, I'm going to have to visit. It seems very inclusive, uh, very partnership based. Um, I love the uh, the pizza garden you mentioned at the beginning. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over now to uh, Anne Marie Naylor in the UK. So, Anne Marie, uh, over to you, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much, Gareth, for inviting me to talk today. It's terrific to follow such a fantastic project. Um, I'm hoping to very quickly take you from a brief history of the work that's been undertaken in the UK by a great many communities now uh, to look at tan what I've called here tangible assets, by which I mean land and buildings in the traditional sense, uh, into thinking about how communities might own and manage a kind of new frontier assets or digital assets in the future. Um, by way of background then, I think Gareth mentioned before that I've spent probably the last 10 years or so uh, working in capital assets for the public, private and third sectors. Uh, and if you look at land, labour, capital and enterprise, the four factors of production in any kind of basic economics text, land's the really interesting one because uh, they're not making any more of it. So as a result of that, unlike labour, capital and enterprise, we find continually some struggle, uh, albeit a very different types and different magnitudes and importance in different communities right around the world. Uh, over land rights from various communities with people trying to achieve a whole bunch of different ends and outcomes uh, for social, economic or environmental kind of uh, impetus. In the UK we've had particularly a long-standing tradition of kind of asset activism and ownership uh, kind of pursued uh, over the last sort of a couple of thousand years. Um, neatly summarised there but 
to bring it bang up to date, that's resulted in kind of five key mechanisms, which I don't think you find really anywhere else uh, internationally uh, embedded in law uh, here so that communities can obtain uh, public assets at less than their market value in the case of community asset transfer. They can nominate an asset, private or public, that they care about and bid for it through the community right to bid, which was uh, only recently re in introduced through the Localism Act. They can demand that uh, an underutilised public asset be given back to them to be put to practical use at the community's behest, and they can use the right to build to establish new uh, kind of assets, whether that be housing or other assets. They can also operate something little known called a compulsory purchase for communities provisions, uh, and really take back blighted assets where they think that that's affecting their neighbourhood. So the, the kind of history of activism has led to five very key mechanisms that are now being used from a pilot programme in the case of asset transfer that started with about 25 projects uh, in 2008 to something like 5,000 inquiries to locality uh, in the last 12, 18 months around community asset acquisition kind of intention from communities. And if you want more detail, there's kind of a link there uh, about each of those mechanisms. This is, the mechanisms generally resulted in kind of traditional land and built assets, whether they be the humble pub, uh, whether it be libraries, youth clubs, parks, uh, that kind of asset uh, going into community hands. But we've seen an increasing trend towards kind of ambitious asset acquisition development on the part of communities in recent years. We've seen peers in the case of Hastings. We've seen people look at community land trusts and housing development to improve the kind of affordability of housing, particularly in rural areas, but also now in uh, London itself. Uh, we've seen people develop community owned and managed assets in the form of community energy schemes. Uh, where they're keen to make environmental impact as well as generate some kind of financial return uh, to be distributed at the local level by the community in a way that they see fit. And in the kind of face of austerity and changing public services, uh, we've seen people wanting to go as far as to consider taking over their hospitals. We've seen them go as far as to say, well, actually, what if we could create a whole community owned and managed community? So housing, infrastructure, uh, as well as facilities in the traditional sense. We've even seen them look at infrastructure assets as bold as ports in the case of Dover People's Port Project, uh, which uh, didn't proceed quite as planned in the end, but showed the level of kind of interest from the community there to take ownership um, of, of the port on a cooperative basis. So they could primarily impact uh, environmental outcomes for young people in the area uh, by exercising greater control over how the port was managed. Um, and Finally, perhaps a bridge too far, the Humber Bridge, uh, uh, wonderful Goodwin Development Trust in Hull, uh, with locality and others, uh, to try to um, see whether or not there was a solution uh, in community hands to owning and managing and operating that bridge. Um, a colleague of mine, Hugh Rollo, always talks about uh, community enterprises that own and manage and develop assets as tense in the gale, as being essential, particularly in deprived neighbourhoods, to the extent that they're, uh, they're the thing that can uh, work in the uh, absence of a private sector where there is market failure, that despite the amounts of public money in, rarely kind of improved dramatically over a lengthy period of years, they're there to be sustainable, resilient in the face of challenge. But I do wonder whether or not in the face of the austerity that we've been kind of enduring for the last five years, but certainly born of the banking crash, so for longer, six, seven years, whether or not we're now looking not for tents in the gale, but tents in quite a raging storm. Um, whether or not we also think that there needs to be kind of some new thinking from communities around uh, the development of assets, because the public and private sectors are both offloading uh, traditional land and buildings at a rate of knots, uh, particularly in the face of technological disruption from pl new platforms like Airbnb, Uber, which are really looking at how to use assets in different ways. In, in, in kind of light touch ways through new business models. Um, I also wonder whether or not uh, the future is now insofar as the World Wide Web has been around for kind of 25 years already. And we still have, you know, growing inequality, uh, worsening environmental problems and so forth. <clears throat> so whether what we need are tents in the gale or whether what we need is actually something that delivers a bigger punch, a uh, greater impact uh, is the kind of question that sparked me moving and thinking okay, we've, we've looked at land and buildings, but what is there uh, in this kind of future brave new world? Is there a kind of a new frontier? Has the economy changed in such a way as communities need to develop different kinds of assets going forward? 
Specifically, we've kind of looked at uh, whether or not that initial slide I showed around land, labor, capital, and enterprise, uh, the kind of agrarian and industrial economies basis has shifted in the information economy, such that communities now looking at developing assets for social, environmental, and economic benefit, uh, or to be looking at uh, fiber, wireless, and Wi-Fi spectrum at the same time as they're considering land, whether they can uh, impact coding robots, drones, and, and, and the automation kind of revolution that seems inevitable uh, with the kind of, uh, kind of hegemonic approach to technological ide ideology from government and others. Uh, we've wondered whether or not they should be looking at crowdfunding as much as they're looking at community investment through things like community share issues. Uh, and also whether or not the lifeblood of the economy is increasingly uh, oriented towards open data, big data algorithms, uh, rather than your traditional enterprise. And how might communities work with that so they can continue to benefit the, the very neighbourhoods they sort of started out kind of looking at a place basis uh, to, to help in the development of traditional land and buildings. So what have we done uh, in a brief kind of hit? We decided another world was possible, um, but <clears throat> nobody was leading the charge. And so what we needed to do is probably give a bit of impetus uh, to people and kind of excite them about getting involved in trying new things and developing different kind of assets. And we started with a program called Our Digital Community, uh, which was kindly sponsored by the Department of Communities and Local Government and others. Uh, and that program worked with 20 community organisations, five of them uh, looking at what I'll talk about in a moment, which is digital assets in a very sort of narrow sense, and 15 looking at very broad ranging digital enterprises. This is a, a obviously a, a presentation about community assets, but just to note on the enterprise front that precisely the same problems that, and challenges uh, that communities face in developing social enterprises of different kinds face those who are trying to uh, work online. So they're still trying to work out how to work with uh, te uh, tech experts as opposed to architects in the case of developing land and buildings. Uh, they've still got to work with the public sector if they want to use data in a particular way. Um, so there are still a bunch of negotiations and expertise, skills, capacity, confidence, and the, ultimately uh, the question, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so in many cases, people using the internet uh, don't appear to pay too much attention to the business models that underpin the apps on their phone uh, or that they use on their laptops and PCs in quite the same way as they appreciate how land and buildings might work by virtue of them being uh, somebody who rents a property or owns a property in, the, in, in their own right. So, so those are the kind of the lessons learned were really that there's a real leap to be made by people working on a not-for-profit profit basis to try to appreciate the kind of business models that could underpin uh, kind of sustainable digital enterprises. But on the digital assets front, which one might have thought would have been a kind of more complicated undertaking, uh, we found communities were incredibly um, proactive, determined, and ultimately successful. In the case of uh, the Lyme Regis Development Trust in the southwest of England, uh, the community was determined to uh, improve upon a kind of broadband and uh, broadband coverage in the area, uh, and pioneered a kind of large open network, uh, working with GriffyNet from Barcelona, who have the largest open network in the world, with 30,000 people using that network. Uh, they built the network along the beach so as not to upset commercial providers and then, then set about developing apps uh, and possible enterprise ideas to work with that Wi-Fi network because they're a tourist destination as part of the Jurassic Coast there. So fossil apps and that kind of thing were developed and looked at. <clears throat> we had more traditional uh, kind of campaigning communities in the rural northwest who were interested in uh, just getting access to the internet at all into uh, some 275 homes. Uh, here in Digital Dales is a fantastic website with lots of details of the project. Um, but essentially, they, the plan there is to dig a 65 kilometre trench around the hills that you're looking at in that picture uh, to plumb in fibre broadband to, to those communities that were otherwise digitally excluded there. And that goes ahead of pace and is one of the, the handful that has received government funding. Uh, to do that with a great deal of local expertise, I might add. What we were particularly keen to note, though, was that this wasn't all about just building infrastructure for the sake of it, connecting people up for the sake of it, that there needed to be social impact. And we worked uh, with the Creative Co-op uh, to support a project called Digital Merthyr in South Wales. Uh, there's a report online at the uh, URL that's flagged on the screen there. 
but essentially the community there we wanted to see could we replicate what happened in Barcelona among largely technically adept and oriented individuals linked to universities and such like could we could we actually help one of the most deprived communities in the country to acquire the digital skills necessary the confidence and also to leverage the capacity within the community the sort of spare time of uh, guys and girls living there to build an open network to connect people up for free to the internet uh, it's quite clear with very se severe kind of um, employment um, and education problems as well as health outcomes for that area uh, that being digitally excluded is, is, a, is a double bind uh, and it was also clear from a, a, an initial piece of research that the community there were completely unable to afford broadband connections for a host of reasons uh, which uh, afflict communities around the world. Some fantastic work that is akin to this um, supported by the Open Tech Institute over in the US um, particularly thinking of things like the Red Hook Wi-Fi project. Um, but what we were particularly pleased to see here was that it moved on and it started to pose some very different questions that we hadn't anticipated at the beginning. So when we began, <clears throat> we thought we were talking about digital assets and digital enterprise, much the same as we had talked traditionally about community land and build assets and community enterprise. But we encountered this whole new terminology around open everything, open source, open data, around the commons, around creative commons licensing in particular, ubiquitous commons licensing, but really critically for us around the sharing economy and the idea of collaborative consumption. So in addition to actually supporting people and upskilling them to aspire to build their own network, manage it and develop potentially uh, skills that would help with employment in the future, but also develop income generating digital enterprises at the local level, uh, we really wanted to tackle the idea of affordability and we're really pleased to work with Mirtha Valley Homes uh, who agreed to share their broadband connection. This is something that's already happening with a Gigabit Libraries project over in the US which is fantastic uh, and they're sharing Wi-Fi uh, in Kansas and other places uh, as part of a big pilot and we're hoping to work with them going forward to kind of extend this kind of project out into the UK uh, some more. But essentially the idea that you can share your connection to make it more affordable is just a really basic one uh, and could really help uh, whack digital exclusion problems. Uh, so a really good reason to think about digital assets that are community owned and managed going forward. We got all those terms in there and we'd done the pilot uh, work and the program work with the initial kind of cohort of 20 organizations but the thing that had really kind of kicked us off in the first place or at least me was thinking about the growing number of communities that called us and said my library is threatened with closure and the problem with libraries is that they're really small quite often when they're offered to communities uh, they can be in rural areas where there aren't many people around they don't open for many hours they can be in poor areas where even if there are lots of people using them they don't have much cash in their pockets and ultimately, the libraries, uh, uh, parks aside, probably the most difficult thing to conceive of how it might generate income and still be a public library and keep true to its ethos, and because after all, they give the books away for free. Um, so we were really sparked in 2010 to think about digital assets and enterprise because libraries were difficult, and it occurred to myself and Mark Diaz at the Creative Co-op, why don't they make money online? So why do you need to make money in a place? But by the time that we got to kind of thinking about prototyping a library of the future that might make money online or might make, uh, uh, generate an income to make it sustainable and offer kind of free to air services and access for all in a different way, uh, we'd already come across these ideas of open and commons and sharing and collaborative consumption. Uh, we were also conscious that in the States and other places there were really uh, a rise of the maker movement uh, and coming and meshing in many uh, kind of public libraries, uh, particularly in Chattanooga, Chicago. Um, so we were kind of inspired to think, well, how do we use capital assets, tradi uh, traditional tools, but also contemporary capital assets like 3D printers? How do we put them into old buildings, so new tech for old assets? to stimulate interest and show what a library of the future could look like in community hands. How do we develop that in a, in a way that is sympathetic and in keeping with a library ethos uh, on an open source kind of business model uh, and this sort of thing. So we, we set that project up. Mark has, has been operating with a number of partners, a project called The Waiting Room, which you can find online uh, now for a couple of years, highly successful. And in the course of kind of thinking about, well, how is it still a library? So when is a library still a library, but not a library? We started to uh, look around and realize that actually the internet can kind of um, 
magnetizers contributions of knowledge and know-how and information you're tweeting you're facebooking every day you're blogging uh, and the data is growing at some exponential rate every 24 hours but our libraries and the kind of common pool of knowledge is not growing in the same way so how did we create a kind of waiting room a give get library a place you could both obtain access to information and learning and skills and so forth but how could you also contribute it in there and how could you mix that in with the maker space was the question yes so i guess we move from a kind of abstract idea around digital assets and enterprise to thinking well actually is there a way in our hometown of colchester where we can leverage community assets that are intangible their knowledge assets that are held within our community that project in turn grew into a project we've now called Common Libraries. Uh, the Common Libraries project has its own project website and a, a recent report there kind of spells out what we've done over the last couple of years, uh, sending out some 400 uh, boxes full of uh, knowledge that captured in the waiting room in Colchester to public libraries right around England uh, just before Christmas and testing out whether there was an appetite to borrow that knowledge in other places but also for people elsewhere to contribute their knowledge uh, to public libraries in new ways. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, it's through three, four months into the pro pilot project, we'd, uh, we, we definitely demonstrated there was an appetite to borrow knowledge produced elsewhere that helped people to make new things and learn new skills. Uh, and there was also some considerable interest in contributing that knowledge as well. Uh, so really interesting project to start to think, how do we rethink about li uh, rethink libraries in terms of different types of intangible community assets and the contribution they might make. Uh, you can find a film uh, under TEDx Brum on YouTube, Prototyping the Library of the Future, which kind of goes into the detail about that project. Uh, so, because uh, we're time limited today. Um, but what I wanted to kind of uh, finish on really was to talk a little bit about, so we've, we've kind of looked at hard telecommunications networks, things that you might hold in your hand like bricks and as you would uh, with a building. We've talked about networks and how you operate a, a Wi-Fi network and how you then uh, potentially have to also provide a broadband connection. We talked a little bit about end user devices, no, not, as, not as exciting as the oven um, talked about before, but in the form of 3D printers uh, and other tools that people are interested at the local level. And what we were struck by uh, a couple of years ago was that everybody was talking about data as being the new gold, the new kind of, well, the equivalent of oil in the industrial revolution. Um, and we were struck that nobody had approached us to talk about how communities might leverage data uh, as a community asset. When we began to look into this, uh, we realised that policymakers and major funders had, had been all but silent on the topic, um, that they were very keen to see how education institutions in the UK look at data and how it might uh, help us to better understand what works and what doesn't in public services, how um, health advances could be made and so forth. They were very happy for data to be released uh, free of charge, public, public, uh, publicly owned data uh, to stimulate private economic development, but nobody was really talking about uh, not for private profit. So we came up with an idea of a data co-op and asked the question, if you can invest in ethical pension schemes, if you can invest in community shares, uh, is, there a, is there scope uh, to invest your data for an ethical return? So to deliver social, economic and environmental benefits, we asked the question, what could data co-ops do? How could they improve standards? Uh, how could they allow uh, local community organizations to communicate with one another in a standard way so that they could learn from one another as big organizations do in-house, using data contributed by their own beneficiaries, and with that, design more impactful services, effectively what we've called ethical data-driven impact investment vehicles. I'm not going to go into how they might work, but I've left the slide there so that people can, after the fact, uh, take a look at that uh, and consider it in more detail if they would welcome that. But we had a project then as a result of that, which set out to explore whether or not our hypothesis uh, could in fact be delivered uh, in practical terms. We needed more data, so we undertook desk research, interviews, workshops, surveys, you name it. And Lo and behold, the findings were, yes, the challenge is there, as outlined. Uh, nobody's really talking about it. There aren't the skills, capacity, so forth, to really take this stuff forward in the way that we would like. But the opportunity is really odd. So the opportunity is there's a gap, a huge gaping gap in the data landscape where there is simply no 
legal vehicle, no representation that's equivalent to what you might uh, establish in order to purchase and manage a building in community hands when it comes to data. So the implication of that is that, if anything, the challenge is bigger uh, than it is with digital assets and digital enterprise as we conceived it when looking at data. Uh, there aren't many case studies of something similar to go on. Um, when we talk about a business to business data co-op or something where organizations could share data for community benefit, there's a risk that that's kind of um, misunderstood by people who think more traditionally of co-ops as being for individual members uh, benefit. But there is nonetheless scope for our data initiatives because it is legally and technically possible to construct one of these. And indeed, there is a great deal of interest among the people we spoke to uh, about taking this sort of thing forward in future. So heartening stuff, and my last three points for you. Um, bridging the tangible intangible divide is really challenging. Uh, the Common City Project in Bologna has a framework which I don't think enshrines uh, community rights in quite the same way as the UK legal framework does or to the same extent, but it does actually talk about the use of public assets in terms of tangible and intangible assets. In the UK, there's certainly a move amongst key organisations and networks to look at commodifying public services and how the commons might be leveraged to do things different in future using technology. And there's also quite clearly the need for new legal and technical kind of uh, frameworks in the form of common based rec reciprocity licenses championed by the peer to peer foundation and others, as well as quantum legals in future. So the future is now rather than coming soon. Uh, and I hope that that gave you a quick canter through the kind of ambitious stuff uh, that some communities are trying to engage with now. Amory, thanks very much. That was a, an amazing uh, tour from from the traditional through to the modern, uh, uh, both 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 in the UK and also signposting to, to sort of international examples as well. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we've got time for questions now. Um, if people want to send questions in, please do so. Uh, just in terms of uh, taking a few early questions for, uh, I'll go to uh, to the Park Avenue folks as as they haven't spoken for a while. Um, is there support available for anyone wanting to find out about community ovens? Uh, Jeff, Ali, question for you. You mean support if there are other people in other jurisdictions interested in learning about them or locally in, in, in Dartmouth? I, I, think, I think whether there's like a sort of an online resource or a national organization or network or something for anyone wanting to, to, to get, get tips about how to do all this sort of stuff. Um, the library is a wonderful resource uh, for us. We've certainly found a, a number of books on the subject. Y YouTube is another incredible asset. And then in yeah. Canada, there, there's the, um, the Dufferin Grove. Is it called The Stop? Yeah. Uh, in Dufferin Grove in Toronto, if you're to Google that. But we've mostly um, we found our resources at the library and online. Um, there's no central network or no other community ovens that we're in touch with on a regular basis. Um, of course, we're always happy to field inquiries ourselves. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Anne-Marie, uh, the question for you here. Please could you flesh out some examples of actual things that you think data co-ops could do? So I guess that's sort of asking you to sort of flesh out the bones a bit of things you might sort of envisage these data co-ops doing. Please. Yeah, so, well, I mean, they can be used in different ways depending on the kind of mission of the organizations that want to participate in them and, and put them together. Uh, the initial kind of question that was posed to me was, was there a way that children could be brought together to collect data about air quality mm. so they could be better learn about their kind of environment and potentially challenge official air quality kind of um, uh, recordings and readings? Yeah. Um, but they, you know, this is this is something that could be used in a different way. So you could, for example, benchmark uh, one one set of service providers who've been delivering, say, children's centre services uh, for ten years or more, uh, to help other people that are just trying to tender to do that in the first instance yeah. you know, through sharing information about what works and what doesn't. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question for Park Avenue uh, again. Uh, were there any legal or planning issues about building the oven? on a public park? Uh, no, there weren't. There were, like I said in the presentation, there were some concerns around insurance. Um, but since we had the park superintendent and our counselors sort of navigate the, the, um, the municipality and resolve that. And it aligned with the, the, the 
the community or the, the Dharma Common Master Plan, and so that was sort of the planning support that we, we had to build. Um, I will add again, just because I think it's so interesting, is that when the people that lived closest to the park were upset about the use of it and they felt they did not have enough opportunity to, to kind of oppose it or to, to have their views heard, um, it, it's an interesting thing when you live close to a public space as opposed to others that may live less close. Uh, it's no less um, an asset to those people that live within the community, the larger community, than it is that live uh, than it is for those people that live closer. So it was it, it was very interesting to see the park become used more by people from from different areas of the Halifax Re Regional Municipality. It became a, a more broader used space and it allowed us to, to bring new people in and, and really kind of broaden the community and it's helped you know we've gotten kind of come over those things and I talked about this a little bit before that people have come around and are quite supportive but it was interesting to watch that you know letting people see others come into their space and use it in a new and, and kind of progressive and fun way uh, as opposed to the way that they were used to using it perhaps kicking soccer balls around or walking their dog. yeah Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, uh, a question for Anne-Marie. Can the common libraries approach be applied to other assets such as museums and galleries? Um, hopefully that makes some sense to you. Yeah, yeah, so I, there's no reason why not. I think the key thing, uh, great talk from uh, Michael Edson last year in London uh, from the Smithsonian who is talking about, uh, hence the picture of the galaxy in the presentation about the fact that uh, there's there's so much uh, kind of knowledge, know-how, information out there, and it's all largely being poured into uh, new uh, institutions, our online virtual institutions, Facebook, Google, and these sorts of places, and blog sites, and et cetera. Yeah. Um, but our traditional memory institutions, including museums and libraries, are not getting those contributions, so why not? Yeah. Okay, um, a question for Park Avenue. Uh, are there any charges or fees for uh, use of the oven? Um, yes, we, if you, the open oven Saturdays are free, um, but if you want to book the oven for something else um, at a different time for, you know, the book launch or the wedding rehearsal or the birthday party, it's around $20. Um, yeah. And that just pays for maintenance of the oven and and the and the firewood that when we had to buy it and and uh, new materials and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, 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 sorry. We're, uh, we're also able to use uh, little bits of money that we bring in through the booking fee to to create things like T-shirts or bags and possibly sell those as a bit of a an income generator to help them become more self-sufficient. So. Those are things that we were planning to do, and, and part of what that money goes towards. Great, uh, thank you. And there's a question for Amory about the uh, what role do you see for local authorities in this brave new world? I think the Bologna example is uh, fantastic. So the Bologna example is looking at how the city can offer up its um, assets in the broadest sense. So its data, its servers, its websites, but also its lamp posts, its land buildings. Uh, so that active citizens can come forward and work in partnership to regenerate, renovate and deliver different kinds of services and impact at the local level. So I think lo local government uh, or, or municipalities are absolutely vital in working in partnership with communities as ever for this stuff. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, what's the, what is the, there's a question for Park Avenue again, sorry, what, what is the legal status of the oven? Is, is it a non-profit? Will you become a non-profit? Yeah, we, we're a registered non, non profit. We we partnered with the existing community gardens um, who are already registered. So that so we're a, a a a small group within the Dartmouth Common Community Garden Association. Yeah, essentially like a, a project committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that so that's the that, that's so the that group. Profit, but, yeah. Go on. Yeah, that like that that group had been registered. I don't know for years and years, and so. Instead of um, doing all that paperwork ourselves, we just sort of um, became a, a working group of that of that committee, and and it and we saw um, by being the same group, as it, it was one way of also sort of keeping that connection between growing food and cooking food. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
do you see uh, probably, uh, for Amory? Do you see common libraries running alongside, inside, or instead of public libraries? I think you probably did cover a lot of that ground, but I just just wonder. It's not the death of the public library, is it? This the common library is it's it's not at all. No, it's a, it's about saying is there a value in common knowledge and know how, and how can that be contributed to libraries of the future, whether they be community managed, publicly managed, or private, or anything else? Yeah. And, and the, the example in Colchester, I mean, does that sit within the public library system? Is it, they, are they a partner? Is it, how, how does that work in, you know, the, the so simple the waiting, Yeah, the waiting, sorry, I should have said, the waiting room is a partner with Essex Libraries as the service, but uh, in the most recent kind of round of work that we've done, we've worked with five public library authorities to try to do it in reverse and establish a common library within the public library setting. Yeah. And so it works, it'll work differently in different places. In fact, most interest has come from the public libraries uh, rather than community managed libraries in the, in the whole approach. Right, um, okay. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'm, I'm conscious we've gone over the hour now. So um, I really want to thank um, our presenters, um, Jeff Overmars and Ali Shavers, Shaver and Anne-Marie Naylor. Um, thank you for participating in this. 